The following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know and join us in our pursuit for the truth. Enjoy the podcast. Hey, necromancy works sometimes. That's going to get in the intro. Good tie into the New Testament, Josh. That's what I do. I make connections, sometimes where there are. But man, I'm good at it. <laughs> I'm toying with the idea that Aristotelian philosophical <laughs> thought. Don't roll your eyes at me. We've lost half our audience. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to the Second Rain Saints podcast. I'm one of your hosts here, Caleb. Less to my left and more straight across from me. Uh, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> who am I? Um, I'm Joshua. And straight ahead of me is Caleb again. But, Caleb, it's just us. Mm-hmm. Sadly. Very sadly. It's very late in the evening. We are recording this very late. But... That doesn't matter because social media is timeless. Timeless. <laughs> we are immortalized on the internet. Yes. Most, so what? What else do we do? Uh, oh, um, we're immortalized on the internet most uh, definitively by our website, uh, mm. Second Rate Saints, uh, www.secondratesaints.com. Um, there you'll find book reviews, our blog, um, as well as links to a bunch of the other stuff that we do. Um, there, we also have a chat feature there where you can send us a small message. If you want to send us a larger message, send us an email. I love getting emails. It blows up our, you know, second rate saints chat that we have amongst ourselves here. Um, that's always a good day when we get some, some interaction from, from you listeners. Um, and yeah, we're also on Instagram and X. I hate calling it X. It's Twitter just sounds better. Anyway. Yeah. But we also express how much we hate X every time. It feels weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and yeah, if, if you follow us on X and Instagram oh, and YouTube as well, um, you'll see some of our upcoming stuff because there is more variety and content in the works. Hopefully you'll see some of that in the new year. And uh, yeah, Josh, you've been known to read books. Yeah, I haven't done oh, what have you read in forever because during school time, I haven't been able to read at all. But I read a fantasy book. It took me about three months to finish this thing. Not, I mean, like I'm a slow reader, but just because like how much time I was studying. And what is that thing? This book is called The Pariah from first book of three from the Covenant of Steel series by Anthony Ryan. The second book is called The Martyr and the third is The Traitor. He has two first names. Can't trust him. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so it's about a character named Alwyn Scribe. Both names he gets, he gives to himself. Um, <laughs> because he is like, so he's a thief. He starts off with a really troubled life. He's like the son of a prostitute from like, oh. yeah. Um, so, uh, hang on, what's the target demographic of this fantasy book? It's like, if you read Lord of the Rings, okay. Game of Thrones. Like that level of fiction. Okay. So like, like you're, young you're, adult slash slash adult. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, this one gets I guess, pretty yeah, more just adult. Sorry. Visceral. Uh. Um, but like, yeah, the character, he's, he's a bad person. He's young. He's genuinely evil. He's a part of an outlaw gang in the forests. Um, he's murdered people for this. Group. Sounds like a great book. I know. Um, but what's really cool about it is <laughs> through no action of his own, by sheer circumstance of his life, he ends up becoming a good person hmm. by practice. And then he realizes that he's been changed. Hmm. Um, the whole story is kind of written in first person. Sorry, in third person. But... There's a ton of first person moments because it's him when he's older writing about the events. Gotcha. Um, and so he's like, so he'll often reference to the reader. Be like, hey, just so you know, this sets me off on like a big. This is a big deal for me. This is a big deal for me at the time. I didn't know that this was going to be a big deal. Uh, <laughs> um, and his future self is good. 
Um, but his current self is genuinely a criminal you would see on the mm. news. And what type of fantasy, like, are we, are we talking? Um, we're talking like magic doesn't appear that often. It's mostly like, let's say like 1200s Europe, okay. Western Europe. So like France, England, stuff like that. Um, it's not based in France or England, but that's the kind of style mm-hmm. you're looking at. Uh, dukes and lords, um, corruption with taxes, the same kind of Robin Hood themes. But it's also kind of like Robin Hood. There's also a crusade going on. Um, and so... Deus Vault. Yes. Uh, so this character, uh, he goes to prison for a while and ends up working with this woman who was a saint or in the book called a martyr uh, of the covenant, which is their religion, mm-hmm. who worship the seraphim, these angels. Um, and the nation kind of runs based on a church and state system similar to Europe at the time, but it's called the crown and covenant is the like breakdown instead of church and state. Now, unlike some, and we're going pretty long on this one. Um, now, unlike some of the fantasy mm-hmm. and even sci-fi books that we've covered where they have like an ex, like not so hidden Christian undertone, mm-hmm. this does not, I'm assuming. No. Okay. It, it, it just doesn't. uses that in its world building. It uses that in its world building, but also in its like, there, there is a theme in there in basically this character's story of quote unquote salvation mm-hmm. is by no means his own mm. decision or action. It's the, the events of the world have brought him. So heavy Protest, uh, heavy, uh, <laughs> uh providence, covenant yeah. theology, yeah. I'm sensing reformed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's it's just through events. Okay. Like it's 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 not like, hey, here's this dark lord, blah blah blah. It's he gets out of prison and ends up in this town um that is run by the priesthood and then ends up joining this thing called Covenant Company, which is run by this fanatic named Ev- Evadine Corlane, who's like a she's plagued with um apocalyptic visions from the seraphil right and she's trying to stop the end times now that's the first book of three yes i see the other two on your shelf yes um having only read the first book yes who would you recommend this book to uh i mean like one of the things it recommends actually is for people who love uh george r R. martin's okay uh, so wheel of time no um oh uh that's jordan's game of thrones um, but they, he mostly, they mostly say that because of the, the visceralness, like it's, it's, it's rough, like mm. the content, like it gets, it doesn't shy away from the horrific, mm. uh, type of things that humans do. Um, but, <laughs> but you're not unlike, selling this book to but me. I'm like George R. R. Martin, who basically the whole book, he squashes the importance of religion in medieval societies. And the story and all does the, not have a good. There are there are no good characters. There are no good characters. Uh, this one is a progression of a man becoming a hero. So it has trajectory morals essentially. Yeah. Like, like like it assumes that there are. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Um, final question because I ask you this all the time. Yes. What is the cover? One out of five. Uh, four. Four. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is? Can you say that one of the Covenant of Steel by Anthony Ryan? Awesome. Yeah. So, book. no doubt, as people have seen on the title of this video yes. or podcast, depending how you're consuming this form of media, uh, we're continuing with our Samuel series. We're getting towards the end here. Yes, we are starting. We are doing chapter twenty-eight today. Yep. There is 31 chapters mm-hmm. for Samuel. Um, and we're going to see how the next one breaks up, but the next one could be our last one. Three chapters? Eh. It's t- it'd two, be two pages. Yeah. It could two be done. Episodes. It could be done. Yeah. We're, we're going to see. I haven't looked at it to break it up yet. Yeah. Um, but before we get into it, what happened previously on Samuel? Previously on Samuel. All of us have to say it. In yes. this case, it's only two of us. So it's not so bad. <laughs> um, okay. So. We talked about how David flees to the Philistines because 
Um, Saul goes on a tirade again. Yeah, after him. Uh, so yeah, David spared Saul's life again in the camp, in the cave, first. Well, yes, and, and then, then Abigail happens. Yes, and then in the camp with the whole, he steals the water and the staff, bashes Abner for absolutely no good reason. <laughs> um, Lord puts you to sleep. Hey, you suck at your job. Yeah. Um, and then David goes, he feels super sad, goes to the Philistines, and he's like, hey, give me a place. We'll protect to this side of your area. Um, I'll work for you. And the David and his men end up in and fighting, like, kind of helping the Philistines in one area as, like, a band of yeah foreign fighters. But they, they also do some shady reporting. Yeah, he ends up lying to Akish, mm-hmm. king of the Philistines, a couple times, where he's like, hey, I'm fighting. Uh, I fought my... I fought Israelites for you. Yeah. And it's, he might not be. He might be. Um, well, he goes and he attacks non-Israelites, the enemies of Israel. Yes. Kills everyone there. So that they can't say anything. Yeah. Which is awful. Um, smart, but awful. Yeah, there's, there's, there's and, good reason why God goes, hey, you got way too much blood on your hands. You can't build yeah. a temple. And then it ends with the first few verses of 28, which is Akish tells David, hey, we're going to war with Israel, which means you're fighting with me. Mm-hmm. And David says, you will see what I am capable of doing. And so David now has assumed the bodyguard position for Akish, which is what David had for Saul. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Now, the text kind of steps away from following David for a second and returns to essentially our, our last long story with Saul. There's a, there's a, yeah, talks about him a little bit more later on. But mm. for Star Wars fans, this is a highlight. You know, because Andor is mentioned. Yes. Um, and also, it's super sad because his relationship with Samuel comes to, to finality. And this is the end for Saul. Yeah, the, it's the, the desperate, reluctant, and regretful man mm-hmm. who spent everything that he has. Um comes looking for another opportunity, another mercy, another way out. And it's just, nah, man, this is it. There's nothing left. You've burned every bridge. Yep. You spent all the money in the bank. Yep. Yeah. So that leaves us. So yeah, this is going to be a super fun one. No. uh (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. Let's start reading. Verse three to seven. Now, Samuel had died and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in Ramah, his own city. And Saul had put the mediums and the necromancers out of the land. And the Philistines assembled and came and encamped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel and they encamped at Geboa. Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. Then Saul said to his servants, seek out for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there's a medium in Endor. Saul, it does mention, Saul did kick out all the uh, necromancers. He did a good job. He did the good job. Well, he follows the law. Like there's... Um, Do you want me to read Deuteronomy 18? Yeah, uh, 10, to, 10 and 11. 18, 10 and 11. But also yeah. it's, it's reiterated in Leviticus a couple times as well. Yeah. Um, I could just read the whole abominations. Eh. Like, it's just the... Okay. Because, um, like, it gives you, like, the, the Lord's mind on this. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall any be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens or a sorcerer, or a chamber, or a charmer, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Saul does, even in this, the credit to what's being said here in the first few verses, Saul did do that. 
He obeyed the law. Mm-hmm. In one instance. And then immediately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, this is a limitation. I need to go find a seer. <laughs> yeah. But it's not. He, there should be something that's noted. He does first go to the Lord. Well, here's one of the interesting things. Yeah, he does go to the Lord. There's no dreams. Um, he, he, the Urim. Yes. Here's a question that I have. Um, the Urim and the Thurim, although this text only says Urim, mm-hmm. is normally thought to be like die or a one-sided disc, like a flipping, yeah. flipping a coin, yes or no. It does mean that they're yes or no things. Mm-hmm. Maybe. It, that's all speculation is the problem. Yep. If it's yes and no, how can it be determined whether God's actually speaking through it? You know what I mean? Unless it's just not yes and no. It's also, David has the Urim. Yeah. Assuming there's only one. You're right. But he does have the ephod. Mm-hmm. Um, with the Urim that, and then he uses it to determine. Does, does it say if he has the Urim and the Thurim or just the Urim? I do not remember. Because it's in the, yeah. he uses it a couple times. Yeah. Um, but also, he tries to inquire of the priests, which ones? The ones he killed? Yeah. <laughs> um, and then also, so the practice of like in dreams that he's mentioning is there was a common practice where the king would sleep next to a religiously significant object. Like a tree that we like mentioned tree, earlier. Or at the temple. Sorry, the tabernacle. Um. And he's getting nothing. Yeah. He's, he's gone through every avenue given. Well, it's the Lord has departed from him. That's what Samuel says in a minute. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, that's, that's said pretty explicitly yeah. earlier on as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, which sucks because, like, yeah, he needs to what, stop hunting David. What I also find interesting, though, is he... Um, he tells his people, hey, find a woman who is a necromancer. Mm-hmm. There's a medium, I think is the word that's actually used. Yeah. Um, and his people just know. Yeah. Yeah. It's also one of the, one of the interesting notes. Um, but it's also, this is important. He says, look for a medium. They find a necromancer. Mm, yeah. But I think this may be, the, I don't know if yeah. the, the distinction is great. I think, I think they found what he wanted. Yes. Um, also, I, I find it interesting that he can divide it. Like one of the commentators notes are like, yeah, he can push out the land for what they offer out of his heart. Yeah. Also, as we've discussed many times in first Samuel in our series is that there is already an, a l- underladen belief in idol worship that has accumulated over the judges period that this population of Israel has, mm-hmm. they have accumulated the practices of the people that There's, they drew about. Syncretism is strong. Yeah. Um, and in this area, as around all the surrounding areas, there is a, a ancestral cult practice that all of the surrounding nations have of that Israel has seen since they have them in the land that he is driv- driving out. Yeah. It's a thing that the people are doing. Yeah. So a point of geography. Mm-hmm. So in, in, in verse four, the Philistines assembled and came out uh, and encamped at Shunem and Saul gathered all Israel and encamped at Gilboa. So um, one commentator points out how it's, it's likely this is foreshadowing the Jezreel Valley battle, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're likely like you see this mentioned in other points in the historical works where the opposing armies will between that valley, Mm -hmm. assuming that it is the Jezreel hill, uh, hill, uh, valley, the battle, um, where they encamp at, uh, at Mount Gilboa. Um, there's, there's a comment, um, the very presence of the Philistine army so far North indicates Saul's weakness and the likelihood that they are attempting to isolate Saul from the Israelite tribes for, uh, even, uh, uh, further to the north, so there's a, there's an ice, there's a geological isol- or a geographical yeah. isolation that they're trying to do there. Also, uh, Mount Gilboa would offer a um, strategic value, like a perspective over the surrounding valleys, not just Mount Jezreel, supposedly. Yeah, 
Do you think there's also a parallel there in that now that essentially David is working with the Philistines? He's isolated him like... No. Saul is the one that's now hiding in the mountains? Uh, maybe. And that... It's such a mountainous region that it's like... Yeah. I, it doesn't seem like he's hiding. He's gathered all of Israel around him. Yeah, but he's panicked. Oh, yeah. He's horrified. Yeah. Um, and you'll see why. Yeah. Um, I'll read the next section. So Saul disguised himself and put on other garments and went. He and two men with him, and they came to the woman by night. And he said, divine for me by a spirit and bring up for me whomever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, surely you know that Saul, what Saul has done, how he has cut off the mediums and the necromancers from the land. Why then are you laying a trap for me for my life to bring about my death? But Saul swore to her by the Lord. As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? She said, bring up Saul for me. Samuel. Samuel, yes. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a God coming out of the earth. He said to her, what is, this, what is his appearance? And she said, An old man is coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. And Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed to his face on the ground and paid homage. So great many questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, for starters, it is interesting that he's like, Ah, you know, I'll give you the name. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, <laughs> yep. Also, she heard the name and went, like, she knows Samuel. He's yeah. famous across the whole oh, land. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it is also interesting that she doesn't recognize that it's Saul until after she sees Samuel. It means, it means that his disguise is very good. <laughs> yeah, but it does. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the question is, does she know what Saul actually looks like? Like yeah. his face. And additionally... It's also odd that Saul swearing by the Lord convinces her. Mm-hmm. Why? Why would that mean anything for her? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Unless, like every other sinner, you still recognize God. Yeah. And, and yeah. And also, Saul, does, uh, Saul doesn't see Samuel. No, and I can explain why. Okay. So, in... The practice that they're doing is a necromantic practice, technically not a medium practice. If it's a medium practice, the spirit would come out of her. If it's a necromantic practice, the spirit would come out of the ground. She's she's not a medium. Yeah. Is she a large? Ah, she's small. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, she would be small because she's a, by definition, a hag. (laughs) (laughs) So she she's an old woman. Um, okay, so here's what it is. The procedures for calling up a spirit. Um, there are examples in of this very same ritual in Homer's Odyssey, Mesopotamia. You're, you're getting and this from Hittite the, literature. Sorry, you're yes. getting this from IVP Bible background commentary. Yes. Okay, cool. Um, pure history. Um, so some Hittite literature, and the Hittite literature shows it the best. Uh, it has to be done at night. After the spot is divined to be where they can pull up a spirit, uh, a pit is dug with a special tool, and then a food offering of bread, oil, or honey is given, of that or either a blood or sacrifice an, sacrificing an animal. Uh, and then once the invocation ritual, including the spirit's name, is chanted, that's why it was significant mm-hmm. that Saul gives the name and it specifies that he goes there at night. Mm-hmm. Uh, it also means that Saul knows the practice. Maybe. It um, could, I think it might be more likely that the two servants that he asks know the yes, practice. Yes, that's, I would agree. The fifth thing is then the pit is covered to prevent the spirit from escaping after the ritual is concluded. Both practitioner and client have roles to play in the procedure. The spirit who emerges were in human form and generally were able to communicate directly with the client. In Mesopotamian necromancy, 
incantations. Only the practitioner could see the spirit. So this is a weird hybrid between yeah. Hittite and Mesopotamia, which is fair enough. That's the, yeah. It, Israel would be one of the colliding places for that. Yeah. Um, and so this is a common practice from Greece all the way to Sumer, mm-hmm. all the way to the Caspian Sea. Um, and so that specifies when the spirit rises out is that pit. Uh, and if it is the case that he can't see it, it's because he has a ritualistic uh, ointment over his eyes. So he's blinded. Hmm. I, so, I do find it interesting that uh, when Saul asks her, mm-hmm. like, what do you see? And she, she, she responds, I see a God coming out of the earth. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's heavily tied to ancestor worship and calling the, the ancestor, yeah. ancestral dead um, in this like quasi divine space. And yeah. Question for you. Yes. Is it really Samuel? I think it is. And I think the reason is, is because it's super sad, but we haven't gotten to Samuel's response yet. Yeah. Um, I, think it's, I think it's Samuel as well. If he's coming out of the ground. Yes. Right. And that's a big thing in there concept mm-hmm. and that's one of the reasons why he has to be called out of the ground because the because yep. in the nether parts of the of the of the earth the foundation yep. of the earth you have the sheol how would you i guess this is this is where i'm going to veer off we'll go down a little rabbit yep. hole why does this not back up the idea that the uh or if it does back up the concept that sheol is actually in the center of the earth <laughs> I have to ask. Joel's not here. I have to ask these questions. No, no, okay? no. You're right. You're right. You're right. Um, or is it? No, I'm not going to go that way. <laughs> I think you could make an argument that that's what Saul would have understood as that he is coming from Sheol, the place of the dead. Mm-hmm. Um, because Sheol, specified by the work and also other study by the IVP Bible background is at the time and many of the communities around because it is a com- Sheol was a common name in all of Canaan. Um, and in Psalms is not always depicted as a place where evil people go. No, it's depicted it's, everywhere. It's Every, just everyone. a place where you go after you die. Yeah. Uh, for continual existence because the soul is kind of, yeah. It's also kind of articulated as it's a quasi conscious existence. Yeah. Not totally not. Mm-hmm. It's actually perhaps more akin to limbo in like yeah. pseudo Catholic mm-hmm. limbo. Not very Catholic, but yeah, that yeah. artistic understanding of you're at the shores, everyone's kind of half their personality's gone, half their, yeah. Yeah. Um, I might be overstepping there. <laughs> yes, but in this one, is you're, you're amongst Sheol is depicted as when it specifies many times that the Lord, as the, the pillars that hold up the earth, the uh, Sheol is the place amongst the pillars. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's why they would be coming out of the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, for the, for the narrative sake and for the under, like Saul's understanding of the world, it makes sense uh, that that's what would happen. Is God simply just, how can I say it? Um, using their understanding and the and the the imaginary of the spiritual realm of that time for his purposes i think he is i mean we the the authors of the psalms use sheol to express pain and distance from god yeah and so it's used in the literary form it's used in their understanding i could see god using it god even references sheol himself Mm -hmm. many times I think, I think and so, it's, it's not a drastic, you see it also yeah. done with the, the cosmic waters. Yeah. Right. Throughout the Old Testament that there's, there's, there's always and has been these chaotic cosmic waters that are not quite nothingness, but like, may, like that's what they yeah. are in the like religious imaginary of the time. And God so. God takes, God takes expressions of the, of our understanding of the world that we have in our times and our places. Mm-hmm. 
and uses which them are to, subjective to which, communicate objective things. Yes, true. Yeah. Um, this is maybe one of the, no. I want to I, no say. I'm toying with the idea that well, Aristotelian philosophical <laughs> thought is the term is the context in which the Trinity is articulated in the early church. Don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> no, you just said. We've lost half our audience. <laughs> Just, the moment you said, I'm starting to begin to think that Aristotelian. <laughs> Shut up. Shut up. No, I'm starting to think that although those are the terms in the context, which are subjective into themselves. That's the context in which the Trinitarian formula is articulated and the Nicene Creed is articulated. It's still objective. Um, and because of what it is attempting to communicate, um, in the same way that we can say that the truth that is being said throughout the Bible, um, is objective, despite the fact that it is being communicated by a language that is developed sociologically, which by its nature is subjective, Mm -hmm. um, and through a cultural religious lens, which by its nature does develop and is subjective. But yet, that doesn't change that objective things can be commu- can't be communicated through those. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Also, God used a necromancer. <laughs> yes. Like, Sorry. I went on a fact, little tangent there, okay? Well, no, no, no. But let's, let's, let's remember, right? <laughs> we just said, we just read the passage where God said, this stuff is abominable. Yes. Anyone who does this. Bad. Bad. And then God... Let Samuel get raised from the dead. Also, it's not condemned. No, but also, here's another thing. And I love that this was pointed out in Bible college. The woman's shocked. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I've, I've read commentaries are split on that. Yeah, but Whereas, she's shocked. And so is she shocked because it's Samuel? Maybe. Or is she shocked because it worked? She could be shocked that it's worked, or is she shocked because it didn't? Because the the covering, yeah, didn't stop him, yeah, and she can't contain quote unquote the spirit, yeah, of Samuel. On the on the other hand, though, the I like the idea of her being like Long Island medium on TLC, <laughs> where like you know it's fake, right? Like she's a palm reader, and then all of a sudden it works, and she's like, oh my gosh, it worked. And that it's the prophet of God that just died. I mean, it's, it's like comical. It's I like, like it. Funny. It's like, that's the best version of evangelism I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know. Because like after that, does she just go, oh, okay, God's right. Syncretism is way too baked in to the culture of the time. I think because there's going to be countless, countless, um, even priests Mm -hmm. that follow the Israelite God. Yep. Um, that are going to be like, yeah, no, fine. Oh, like Eli. Yeah. Yeah. Like in the beginning of the book. Anyway. So speaking of Eli, (laughs) let's get back to the common thread of Samuel's life. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Calling out everybody. Um, so then Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Saul answered, I am in great distress, for the Philistines are warring against me, and God has turned away from me and answers me no more, either by prophets or by dreams. Therefore, I have summoned you to tell me what I shall do. And Samuel said, Why then do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and you became and became your enemy. Since why then do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and became your enemy. The Lord has done to you as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor David. Because you did not obey the voice of the Lord and did not carry out his fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, the Lord will give Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow you and your sons shall be with me. The Lord will give the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Ah, we mentioned this earlier. Um, actually, Josh mentioned it earlier. This is kind of the same message that he had to give to Eli and his sons when he was a boy. Yeah. Yeah. He, they're going to go out. They're going to go to war. 
and they're going to lose. lose. Your sons are going to die. And it's the same army. And you'll, you'll die too. Yeah. And it's the same army. Yeah. And there's another parallel there. The sons of Eli thought that they could use God's implements for their own devices. Right? They mm-hmm. brought the Ark of the Covenant out to win. Mm-hmm. Right? By their own design. And Saul is subverting God by trying to force him to talk to him. Yeah. Even though he's been told multiple times by the Lord that he's like, no, you're not, you're not my king. Mm -hmm. I've rejected you. It also, it's so desperate, man. Oh, I I feel, I, I feel bad that I feel for Saul throughout it because I, I know I'm supposed to, you know, David's a man after God's own heart. Like, well, yes, that's true. He's also a, a, you know, warlord. Um, but you know, like every king at that time was, but, uh, (laughs) yeah, but it's also, it's just the, there's no, the fuse has run out. Yeah. You know, it's time to collect. Yeah. You're, it's done. Yeah. I think, I mean, okay. So there's two things. Samuel, first of all, the Lord brought back Samuel from the dead just to tell Saul one more time. Yeah, because it could not have, it may have not have not worked. Yeah, it, it could and have not worked and the same thing would have happened. He would have died. I wonder what the, the actual significance is. I mean, because it, it's not, it's not helpful to put into the biblical text Hey, necromancy works sometimes. No, I think there's... Can I... Yeah. I'm not... That's going to get in the intro, maybe. Yes. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Necromancy works sometimes. (laughs) Well, no. If it's demonic, then it works. But it's just... Ah. Anyways. um, No, I think... Can I make a parallel to the New Testament, but not directly related to the crucifixion? Please. Um, When Jesus... When the... When... Jesus gives his parable about Lazarus and the Pharisee. And at the end, he says, if you will not believe in the law and the prophets, you will not believe a man raised from the dead. Yeah. Um, I think there's something there. It seems as though Saul believes this. Yes, but he also believed it every other time, but it didn't change him. Mm. And... And so the, the very fact that he's asking to raise a man from the dead by subverting God through necromancy. He's asking, think about this. His thought process is, I will raise the prophet of God through the necromancy that the prophet of God would have told me to condemn. Well, it's just, he's so contorted and, well, yeah. I, think, I think what it is, is it's, it's, a, it's a perfect example of the early stages of idolatry. Oh, yeah, no, but what I mean is that he has actively rejected the word of God mm-hmm. from the Lord himself. It, yeah, it also shows that he just wants the effects of following God, not the, not to do, mm-hmm. not the actions of actually following yeah. God. It was a salvation without the obedience. Yeah. And, and I wonder, this is my next topic, my next For my thought, next trick. <laughs> for my next trick. Um, <laughs> my next thought is the Lord rejects him as king. But does he reject him as the people of God? What do you mean? Is, is Saul going to hell? Or, I, is, <laughs> or is he just rejected as king? Well, w- was all of Israel, simply by being Israel, saved? Well, I mean, the, the, it's, <laughs> I think it's easy to say that he's been, he's been completely... He wasn't in the he wasn't in the group anyways. His faith wasn't enough. Yeah. yeah. Um or as somebody who had the spirit prophesied, did all the things. Or is that the same as Jesus when he says when the people come up to him saying, We cast out demons in your name, we prophesied and blah 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 blah. And we said, Lord, Lord. And he says, I never knew you. Yeah. But, and, but also how the spirit works yeah. in the Old Testament. And we, do, we don't totally know the distinction. There'll be people that 
will that mm-hmm. may know. There are people that may say they know, and I don't know the difference yet. Yeah. But there are those who say there's a distinction because in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God came upon people yeah. temporally. But in the New Testament, through he the work dwells. of Christ, it indwells. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, and there's, a, there's more of a, I don't want to say a union, but there's more of a, of a yeah. cooperation. Yeah. Um, and that distinction, I think, is, extre- is extremely important, at least in the New Testament. Although in the Old Testament, it's less articulated. And so I, I, th- I think though there is something there with the, the people who come to Jesus saying, because he says, Lord, ab- all the absolutely, time. Absolutely. Absolutely. He but prophesied. I, he has those people like you're not the children of Abraham simply because you're. Well, no. And that's what I mean is that that passage is specifically stating someone like Saul mm-hmm. and G- and Jesus says, I never knew you. Yeah. Cause Saul, could, Saul can say, I defeated armies in your name. Yeah. I defeated a guy called I, the serpent. Yeah, I cast out um, necromancers. Yeah, out of your land in your name. Yeah, oh, never knew you. Yeah, fair enough. You know, good tie into the New Testament, Josh. It's what you do. It's what I do. <laughs> I make connections sometimes where there are none. <laughs> <laughs> but man, I'm good at it. <laughs> and then that leads us to our well, yeah. The back to the Samuel point is just like. <laughs> He had to, it's so sad. So this is the third time Saul has had to send this message. He had to send it to Eli and his sons, his very first prophecy Mm -hmm. of, hey, you've been horrible. You're stealing stealing God's glory. Becoming fat off of God's glory. Think about this, right? Both times. So it's, there's parallels. It's the first and the last prophecy Samuel gives, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same message. And both times he's being forced by the person he has to give it to. It's also the consequence that he was warning against the people when they wanted a king. Hey, he's yeah. going to take all your people. And when he goes astray, you'll, you'll be your counted sons with will it. Die in your sons yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. But it's also, the summation of, of his the, prophecies. It is. But it's also the like, Eli told Samuel, right? Tell me what the Lord has said. Because if you do not tell me, it'll come down on you mm. right and so eli's making him say it oh in this case saul's making and saul literally raised him from the dead to, 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 to make him tell him what was gonna happen yeah and the answer is the exact same you and your sons will die then he goes back to bed but no, the way uh, he sorry. says it, no, but the way he says it is like, and it, you will join me. It also, yeah, there's the, you will join me. It's also like Samuel's raised, raised up, right? Why did you, why did you disturb me and bring me up? And Saul lays it out. He's like, I'm in great distress. The army's, I will like, well, tell me what to do. Right. Yeah, I have. And then it's Samuel's response is not like, you know, he's talking to like God's told, filled him in and told him yeah. what to say. He's like, Oh, dude, it's obvious. You're screwed. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like dude, his, his have, re- you, have you not been listening to me? Yeah. Well, here, here's the answer. Like, he, Saul yeah. goes through his thing. Yeah. And right at, as he's doing that, no doubt Samuel's like thinking back to when he originally told Saul, mm-hmm. hey, no, God's torn the kingdom away from you. Samuel's response after Saul's like, hey, this is why, because it's like bad stuff's happening. What do you tell me to do? Samuel's response is, why then do you ask? Uh, why then do you ask me? Since the Lord has turned from you and become your enemy, well, like, he's, he's just like he's why are you? He's basically saying the answer is obvious. Well, no, he's not just saying that. He's basically saying, yeah, you said the reason. Yeah, he's just said the reason why he's not talking to you. Like, why? Why won't the Lord talk to me? Because he's not. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's turned. He's yeah. What's yeah? It's, it's, it's super sad. Yeah, it's, but again, it's the, we said this before we made this connection with our confession episode, but like Saul has been living a life of attrition. Yeah. Not contrition. Yeah. His, attri- his, uh, his contrition or his attrition never turned into yeah. contrition. Mm-hmm. And he doesn't actually feel bad. He just wants to not be punished. Punished. Yeah. That leads us to the last part. Roth. Then Saul fell at once 
full length on the ground spread eagle. <laughs> that That's not what it says. <laughs> <laughs> then Saul fell at once full length on the ground, filled with the fear because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten nothing all day and all night. And the woman came to Saul, and then she saw that he was terrified. She said to him, Behold, your servant has obeyed you. I have taken my life in my hand and have listened to what you have said to me. Now, therefore, you will also obey your servant. Let me set a morsel of bread before you and eat what you may have, then have strength when you go on your way. He refused and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, served, urged him, and he listened to their words. So he rose from the earth and sat on the bed. Now the woman had a fattened calf in the house, and she quickly killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it and baked unleavened bread of it. And she put it before Saul and his servants, and they ate. Then they rose and went that night. There's some interesting parallels here with another story. So before we get into that, um, it's thought that fasting has, has to do with the ritual. Mm. Um, that's one of the reasons why he's... Yeah. Um, however, there may be connections with the idea of not only is he just drained, like well, fasting and prayer before the Lord, yeah, because he was inquiring of the Lord all day before that, mm -hmm. but also him chasing after, yeah. Um, let's say before you go to combat, mm -hmm. you want to be well rested, um, well fed, like top, tip top of of, of performance, right? Mm -hmm. Um. But in pursuing God in unrighteous means, he has become um, both depressed, but also he, he can barely eat. He's just, mm -hmm. he's, he's not, he's not he's a not prepared state. He's not, he's not, he's not. He's not uh, taking care of himself. Yeah. He's not functioning. He's completely He's not consumed. what he needs to be. Yeah, he's completely consumed by fear and paranoia. Yeah. Well, he's, he's not in the position that he needs to be. No. He needs to be strong in the Lord, strong of in, in, in actual physicality, and he needs to be strong. So he needs to be strong physically, spiritually, and mentally. Mm -hmm. And he's not. He's not strong spiritually. He doesn't have a. He doesn't have a relationship with God at all. No. He's not strong mentally because he's, as you mentioned, uh, terribly afraid and paranoid. Mm -hmm. He's not strong physically. Yeah. He's been carrying around a weapon to kill one man. Yeah. Everywhere he goes, and failing. Every time. Yeah. Because the Lord keeps getting in his way. Yeah. Which. <laughs> Snap time, Abner. <laughs> <laughs> I love the idea of just like Michael just going to God. Like, so how are we going to do it this time? And God's like, watch this. <laughs> Abner's going to sleep. <laughs> Boom. Um, this is the melatonin no knob. <laughs> Crank that bad boy up. Uh, um. So there's some interesting parallels. Mm -hmm. Saul has two servants with him. And he is himself. And he gets served the exact same meal by a woman who, by a lower servant of his, the woman. Mm -hmm. uh, the same meal that Abraham offers the three men. Oh. And then they go their way. What kind of, well, I was going to ask, what kind of um, unleavened bread are we talking about that she has to kill the fattened calf? No, because calf means meat, and then it talks about bread. <laughs> no, so she. So we she, talking beef? Dip? She does the same thing Abraham does. She goes, gets the fat and like the the choice meat, mm -hmm. and kills it. It's probably her only one. Mm. Um, and so this is a huge. Um, she has the king mm -hmm. in her house. She knows that now, right? And so she kills her only animal. Uh prepares it with a full meal and gives it to the king. Mm -hmm. She gives her first fruits. Mm. Probably. Yeah. But a corrupt necromancer <laughs> is giving the best that she has to a corrupt king. And yeah. it's in a, it's like a mirrored, it's like a dark mirrored version of Abraham giving to the three men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. This is not me. This is this is the IVP Bible background. Yeah, it's well, the same meal. Walton's office rocker. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's an opinion piece from an undergrad. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's interesting because those men come. God comes to Abraham 
with you will have a son. Mm -hmm. She laughs. There's no laughing and all the sons are going to die. No. Yeah. <laughs> Your sons are going to be taken away and I, he's terrified. I don't see the link that's super strong. Yeah. No, it's just I do an like to think that parallel. it's beef dip, though, because yeah. it's the fattened calf, and then there's bread, and uh, yeah, yeah. Um, hot, hot roast beef sandwich. But it's a, <laughs> it's a. One is a message of hope and new life, and this one is the end of a life. Mm -hmm. This was the end of a line. That is the beginning of an entire people, and this is the end of a family. Yeah, because sadly, what does this mean? Who's his sons? Well, David's best friend. Jonathan. Yeah. Who has done nothing but obey God. Mm -hmm. And not to mention the army of Israel. Yeah. But in the Eli section, the comparative, his sons were evil. Mm -hmm. Jonathan's been nothing but good this whole time. And David doesn't get it. And David is at the battle that kills Jonathan. It's rough stuff, man. <laughs> because of Saul's actions. His, his sins are passing down to his. Yeah. yeah. Wild. But. Uh, so. I, the story always stands out to me. Yeah. First of all. Because uh, I always wanted a Veggie Tales to cover it, but <laughs> you don't think they do an awesome <laughs> job? <laughs> actually, can I? There's actually one line from they did Gideon, mm -hmm. and it's but Gideon has like a marching band, <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's Larry the Cucumber, obviously. But uh, uh, he has a marching band, and that's the the trumpets. With yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And so they go to war with this like marching band. There's a really good line where the angel comes to Gideon. And he's like, hey, I just want to say, like, you guys are pretty amazing. And he's like, why? Like, you're an angel. What are you talking about? And he says, yeah, but I have faith because I am in God's presence constantly. Mm -hmm. You're believing and you can't even see him. Mm -hmm. You're about to go to war. And you're not in his, like, you don't see what I see. Mm -hmm. That's pretty amazing. Hmm. And it was just like, that's a, that's a good. I just want to see necromancy and veggie tales. <laughs> just, you know. They did Jonah and the whale. Right. He is raised from the dead. He is maybe. From Sheol. Mm. Same place. Here's the thing. Maybe eaten by a demon. No. <laughs> uh, Definitely. <laughs> according to Jesus, it's a sea monster. And Psalms. Yeah. 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 Um, now we're just getting on <laughs> theology. <laughs> Weird so, theology from from. Uh, let's see. So this is this is the end Jonah. of Saul. Saul is Saul's done. Yeah. Well, it's setting all, up all the pieces to to the end of of a uh, dynasty. Not yeah. so much a dynasty because it's one man. Okay. But wait. Do you think? Try to. <laughs> this is. I should probably leave this. The next when. The next episode. Saul dies. Um, because does he die in thirty one? Yeah. Um, do you think there's a similar way, a similarity to between Saul, who had the spirit, prophesied, blah blah blah, rejected the Lord, and then commits suicide, like getting his guy to kill him, mm -hmm. with Judas, who was a disciple, then betrayal. And then mm. commits suicide. I mean, I'm end. sad in both cases. So that's a, that's a pattern. Yeah. Um, but like had the opportunity was, was killing, was trying to kill the Messiah figure in the passage in the sections of their lives. Saul trying to kill David. If, if, Judas trying to kill Jesus. Well, I mean, Judas is far more successful than Saul. Um, except yes. Except he, yeah, he brings about the salvation of the world in that regard. But, you know, it'd be better mm -hmm. that he had not been born. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I'm buying time for me to answer this question. And instead of repentance, he... His, his realization of what he's done, the result is he kills himself? Yeah, I mean, they're... Oof. 
the, I mean, there's the bitter, you've gone too far. Mm-hmm. Right. And I know that's a pattern in Christian thought is that there is, you can't go too far for God's grace. And there's a way that's, a, that's totally true. Mm-hmm. I, I do believe that. There's actually a, a, a video I saw. It was, I think it was an Instagram reel. It might have been a YouTube short where it was talking about a, um, a, uh, I don't know if I can say this word. I can, can I say, you know, 40s German in, uh, in, on without YouTube going like, hey. Um. Anyway, so uh, there's a in 1940 there was Germans. <laughs> um. Yes. Um, a specific group of Germans. A specific group of Germans. <laughs> um. A guard at a certain place. <laughs> um. I don't think it was a guard. I think it was it was more of an official. Yeah. And then in the Nuremberg trials, he yeah. uh, asks for a priest. Priest comes, does confession, takes the Eucharist. Yeah. Done. Repents. Right. Polish. Yeah. Um, priest and according to the priest according to his guards yes well he was executed um, the idea would be no he was absolved of his sins we will see him again yeah right and the interesting thing for me was how how lit up the comment the comment section of this video was because for so many people is no he he's gone too far how can God forgive and mm-hmm. the other people are there is no there is no limit to forgiveness yeah right um you're not, there's no limit to forgiveness. You cannot go too far that God's grace cannot follow. Yeah. Right. Um, but unless it's the, the true repentance is yeah. brought upon by the spirit, yeah. not by regret of consequences. Yeah. And maybe that's the determining factor, the difference between when mm-hmm. is the person, like their heart is hardened so far, like, you know, God has hardened their heart. They've yeah. hardened their heart in this like synergistic way. Right. Yeah. Um, which is, I think what we see perhaps with um, the case of Saul and, and yeah. we can maybe infer that with Judas. It, at what, like, and and, and uh, in Hebrews with, yeah. us, with uh, Esau, with yeah. the whole, though he sought forgiveness with tears. Yeah. Is that in Hebrews? No, that's in Romans. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Now I'm starting to ramble a bit, but do you know no, what no, I'm no, talking no. about this? Yeah. yeah. The, Cause my thought would always be, at any point, Saul could just take the crown off the head mm. and just say, hey, David, it's on the throne. Go grab it. Let me go uh, farm some cabbages. I'm going to go back to my dad's farm. I, you know, it's yours. The mm. Lord has anointed you. Mm-hmm. I've sinned. Yeah, I suppose. That, you know. that would always be an option. Uh, yeah, I mean, even his court, right? Like... He mentions when he's sitting below the tree where he's like, even the, like, where is everybody? Like, not where is everybody? Why, where is David? Why isn't anyone telling me? Are you all, you know, yeah. just waiting around for David to take the throne? And then it's a non-Israelite who's like, oh, I know where David is. Yeah. Oh, was that our favorite middle villain? Yeah. That isn't mentioned again. Doeb? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Doeg? Doeg. Yeah. yeah. And so like, even, even the, like the, the noble court is kind of like, oh, I'll just wait for David to show up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At any point, I think, because it couldn't be that Saul goes, hey, David, just come back home. Saul, went, David wouldn't trust him. Yeah. Right. It has to be, I've abdicated the throne. Here you go. Mm-hmm. It's yours. This now belongs to the house of David. And, and that Until might be. Until he gets back, Michael, here you go. That might be why. Um, David never goes with him after they make up those two times, like once in the cave mm-hmm. and then once when he uh, goes into the camp that's asleep. Absolutely. Because he's like, oh, but you're not surrendering the throne? Okay, then I'm not going home. Yeah. And the Lord has rejected you as king. Act on it. Mm-hmm. Give the kingdom up. Yeah. I suppose. I suppose. You know? And I, but at this point, I don't think that's possible because the enemy is at the gates. If he takes the helmet off, right? And David's on the enemy side. Yeah, he set the pieces up so that he can't. Yeah. Yeah. Who's going to defend the kingdom? Yeah. Is, is, he takes the, the throne off, sends the message to Akish, and then David's just like, okay, starts killing the Philistines. He's eh. vastly outnumbered. But, you know, if he's with God, it doesn't matter. Numbers don't matter. Yeah. But, but it's, it's also, it's the, the hardening of the heart. God moves yeah. the pieces. Yeah. 
But uh, we'll up see in, if we'll up see. until this moment, I feel he could have just taken the crown off. Hmm. Uh, to me, the heartbreaking one is this, is when they go to sleep, which is in our last episode. When mm-hmm. when God puts them to sleep, right? And David and his um, what nephew go in and they take his the spear and the water jug. Um, in the cave. David in the cave episode, which is very similar to the to the spear in the the water jet yeah. episode. Um, David makes claims of, "I'm your son, you're my father," mm-hmm. or uh, "You're my f- father," and gives very honorific titles. In the water jug and spear, it's less of that, and Saul's response is, "You're my son." Mm-hmm. So there's and this David's rift. Like, I've done nothing to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's it's rough. Um, We'll see if there's going to be one or two more episodes. Might just be one. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully everybody could he- be here for that. I think it's going to be two. Because, so the next two are the Philistines reject David and David's wives are captured. Yeah, we're, we're, we're going to. Yeah. I think that. that's going to be one. And then we do one episode on the last chapter. <laughs> It'll be good. Hopefully uh, Joel is here for that because I know he's, he's upset about missing this one. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for making it through the episode. Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, sticking along. If you've been staying with us in step for the Samuel episode, uh, series, um, again, check us out on our website. You can see all the links of what we're doing there. We're on X, we're on Instagram, we're on YouTube. You can find this podcast wherever podcasts can be found and as well on YouTube. Um, if you're a subscriber on our YouTube channel or, f- uh, follow us on Instagram or technically X as well, I guess. Uh, you'll see, you'll get a notification because of of some, let's say, side stuff that we're working on rather than just the main podcast that'll be mm-hmm. coming down probably later on in the new year right away. If you want to send us an email with your thoughts, comments, concerns, questions, recommendations, book recommendations, um, you can either go to the website, tell it to the chat bar, or uh, send us an email. Either we do enjoy, we do enjoy. Um, yeah. Read your Bibles. <laughs> should, should we end the podcast? I think we should probably end the podcast. No. Yeah, well, I'm going to end the podcast. You don't get to decide. I, are you going to fight me with the button? Sure. <laughs> <laughs>